Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Unchurned. I'm Josh Actor, CEO and founder of Update AI. Really excited to be here today with Alex Farmer, VP of CS at Cognite. Um, Alex, welcome. Thank you for being on the show. Super excited to be here, Josh. Thanks for having me. Did I say the name of your company correctly? It's Cognite. You said Cognite, but it's fine. I did, like, it happens all the time. <laughs> You know, the, 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 um, the syllables were always the hardest thing in Spanish class in high school, getting the accents correctly. So Sorry, Josh, do you mean syllables? Them. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. The syllables. Yeah, syllables. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those Go are on, awesome. man. Let's do it again. Yes. Yeah, you're good. I was never able to roll my R's. <laughs> ah, I'm still working so on it. So we've got... Yeah, right. Um, so VP of, of Customer Success at Cognite, founder of the Customer Success Excellence Awards, and we want to talk about that. You were previously at Sage People, running CS over there, and you're a top 25 influencer of 2021 from the Success Hacker folks. Congratulations on that. If I had a little button for round of applause, I would, I would give that to you. <laughs> um, you guys just wrapped up your June edition of the CS Excellence Awards in London. How'd it go? The first edition, Josh, indeed, and it was in London. This is where I'm, I, I live. I'm originally from California. That's where the accent comes from. But uh, it went very well. You know, I, uh, I'm not an event planner. I'm an amateur event planner at best. But, uh, you know, all of the things that could go wrong did not go wrong, um, which was great. But most importantly, I think we achieved our goal. I, I set the bar pretty low. If, my, if our, if our uh, generous sponsors are listening, please, please uh, close your ears. The bar was set very low uh, because ultimately the goal was just to do it and make it good enough for us to accomplish our goal, which was to, to really find that next generation or the less, let's say the quieter, but maybe higher quality voices in customer success, right? And you know, the awards gala and the nice meal and open bar uh, was the cherry on top, if you like. Um, but we, we definitely accomplished our mission and I'm really excited about trying to continue to highlight those people who are really maybe taking less time on LinkedIn and more time invested in, in advancing our profession, um, which uh, I think for, I'll speak for myself when I say present company excluded there, but uh, uh, you know, that's, that's the goal and that's exactly why we exist. So we're really happy to, uh, to also be bringing it to the Americas uh, later in 2022 as well. So stay tuned uh, for that one. Yeah, I want to probe into that. It sounds like I'm not going to get much out of you there, but I would love to know what the stay tuned is. It's been, I, I checked out the website and, and the whole, you know, coming soon, stay tuned. Can you give us any get a little stale. Peak? Yeah, what, what, what? I know. You want me to break yeah, some news, yeah. Josh? Is Come that on, what you're man. looking for? Yeah. All right. I want, so I want locations. The news breaking podcast. Yeah, exactly. This is the, yeah, I'm going to call you Wolf Blitzer. Here we go. Um, you need the big breaking news banner here on the video, but, uh, I can't tell you the location yet because we haven't decided, but I can tell you that we're thinking about, uh, I mean, there's a couple of things that I would have liked to have done differently. And, you know, this is, again, it, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It's, it's largely me and uh, another, uh, uh, somebody who I met actually in that LinkedIn echo chamber who's volunteering his time as well. But uh, more time for folks to apply. We had one, exactly one month open for nominations to be submitted. Uh, and we're asking people to submit a lot of information. You know, this is not a popularity contest. This is a, let's say, quality over quantity, right? If you get one nomination or 10, it doesn't matter. We take the best case that you make. So, so giving people more time, we're thinking about opening nominations in September or October, um, and then having our judges also have a couple of months to review those nominations. It was pretty, uh, we asked a lot of our judges in a short period of time. And that means that I think the awards will be hosting somewhere. And I can tell you we're looking to do somewhere warm uh, and somewhere maybe not on the coast. I'm from San Francisco and so I'm actually headed over to San Francisco for uh, a big CS conference in a couple of weeks. So I'm coming home, but there's plenty of CS programming on the coast. So and trying you're, to find you're, a place you're where- You're cryptic about that, Alex. Can, can we just say that you're going to Pulse? I'm going to Pulse. Yeah, exactly. I'll see you there, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm looking forward I'm to that. I'm actually talking uh, interview from you, by the way. I'm hoping to really like open up here. You know, I, I forgot to do the the, the unturned um, segment up front to really kind of build the relationship with you. Maybe we have to revert back to that and loosen you up. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, good. Just be an open book and stop being so cryptic. Yeah, Is yeah. that the, those are the probably the top two? Great, yeah, great, great. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm going to pulse. I'm not going to be cryptic about that. But we we haven't launched. Uh, we haven't decided on a city yet. But we're thinking about somewhere in the the south or the southeast. Let's say. 
uh, where it's warm. We're thinking about doing it in February as well. Um, uh, in 2023, that's where the awards gala is going to be. And I will say we're looking to do uh, at least 300 to 400 attendees. The one in uh, the awards gala in London, we had about 175 and it was a packed house. But I think uh, I've just actually watched the video back from the highlight reel, which is not public yet. But maybe I can break the news that it'll be public today. I'll announce it here. If you need some news, it's not even newsworthy, but let's just go with that. Uh, the recap video we're gonna we're gonna make live so people can understand what the hell I'm talking about. They can see it with their own eyes. But uh, yeah, we're thinking about somewhere in the south or somewhere warm that's not coastal. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. You make your suggestions, everybody. There you go. It's, uh, uh, but we're looking forward to it. I think February 2023. That's the news that we can bring. Awesome, February 2023. You heard it here, folks. Um, first, folks. First, that's right, Josh. First, what a privilege that is. February 2023, we'll see you in Nashville, Tennessee, for the next customer success okay. awards. That's my. It's a guess. good guess. It's a good guess. I would say it's on the short list. I've got three. You know, why don't I just say the three? I can tell you the three that I have in mind. Okay, you got Miami. Okay, Miami, great choice. Far for the coast to get to, for the West Coast especially. Uh, Austin, Texas, really big CS community out there with no kind of home turf vendor, right? Um, and then Nashville is one that uh, hasn't been on the top of the list, but I've seen a lot of companies now hosting events there and it looks pretty exciting. So I think those three are probably the most likely. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll let the, uh, the, LinkedIn, the, uh, the podcast and LinkedIn audience uh, fill in the blanks here. Maybe we'll, uh, I don't know, it's not democracy, but we'll see what we end up with. Okay, fair enough. Should we go a little bit deeper here in the conversation? We'll get to some more, some more meat. Um, but, but before actually we do that, because you've referenced it, twice now. Um, something that I've talked a lot about with, with other CS leaders, and it's this kind of customer success echo chamber that seems to be have evolved, which by the way, is a great thing in many ways. Like I, I've seen this rise in the voice of customer success. So I, I applaud and support that. And that's what we all need to work together to increase the influence stature, you know, Im impressions of, of CS. But what's your opinion on that? Because I, I, I get the sense that you do have an opinion on it. I got an opinion on a lot of things, but this, this thing is included, Josh, indeed. I mean, I think I'm a little bit worried, you know, about, you know, it's a professional, it's a very open community. People give their time uh, and their energy uh, to advance our profession. And, and I, 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 I worry a little bit about kind of a, that energy not then being applied to finding new energizers, right? Because, you know, people have a certain amount of experience and, and experience kind of shapes your perspective. But more different, varied experiences and more perspectives help advance our conversation, our profession. You know, I think we're, as you say, we're very early in, in the, the customer success movement. I, I hate to use that word because it's just a job function. It's not some like big change campaign. but you know, the customer success uh, environment, let's say. Um, and, and there's a lot of people that I think, and, and I'm not sure why, right? You know, again, that's why we created the awards. It's to, at least in a meritocratic way, identify some folks who we'd love to invite in, right, um, to that conversation. But I think there's a couple of reasons why I feel that maybe we are where we are. And again, no disrespect to those who are actively participating in, the, in this uh, 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 thought leadership circle. Right, you know, it's it, their 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 uh, opinions are important, but but I think um, we need more because people need to be challenged. Right, you know, you if you hear certain certain folks kind of just repeating the same stuff year on year out, maybe it's their thing, but who's coming in and saying, actually, you know what, I did it differently and it worked better. Right, you know, I feel like we're still kind of stuck in this customer success is not support or uh, we're different to account management theoretical surface level conversation and we're missing this uh here's how i improved our mps score by 10 points by investing in digital touch customer success discourse right that that's that level below the more tactical um non-theoretical conversation and there's a couple of reasons why i think we are there we're a little bit stuck because customer success is growing so quickly which means there's still a huge need for a new to CS audience to hear that theory, right? I mean, you know, let's call it the 101 course of customer success. People are taking their entry level course, transferring into our profession, which is a great thing, right? But, but I think the challenge is you have a lot of folks who maybe been in leadership positions for two to five years that are either listening to this discourse and thinking, 
wow, I don't think I could uh, contribute in the same way, or they're just not leaning in and participating, right? And I think maybe because sales leaders, let's say, just as an example, have been, I was talking to a recruiter about this the other day, you know, the number of years of experience for a CRO is what, 15, 20? Uh, let's just go with that. And for a CCO, you're talking 10 or less. It's probably even more extreme than that, right? VP sales, VP CS. So you have these folks who are, you know, who've grown really quickly in their career and maybe, you know, are struggling a little bit with imposter syndrome or, or not wanting to engage. And I think there's just such a, given that the community is so open, I, I really, you know, hope that people find their voice and we invite them into that conversation and you don't have the same top 25 faces, uh, uh, you know, coming and showing up uh, to Pulse and everything else. Um, so, so my hope is we can really push this conversation forward by inviting others in and accepting that we should all be challenged to, to, to drive our profession forward. I, I want to poke and pry at a couple of things there. I, I vehemently disagree with you. You said, I have invited you, right? We invited, this is the discourse we must have, please. Well, I haven't yet read the, the 101 book on, on how to host a podcast, so I can break all the rules without knowing them. <laughs> I'm sure Go that's on. the first book. Uh, you heard it here first also, folks. Alex Farmer says, CS is just a job function. There was something at the end of that. But anyways. I said something. Not a movement. It's not, not a movement. movement. Not, a movement. I think I said, not like it's yeah. a movement. Yeah. Okay, bullshit. CS is, is go on. <laughs> CS is a job function, sure. But I think what CS really is and needs to become to get out of that echo chamber, which relates to your last point, is a movement, right? Like customer success will, and I've had conversations. I had a great conversation with Chris Hicken hmm. of, of Nuff Said yesterday about this. I had a great conversation with Edward Chu and, and Ben Wynn also yesterday about this. Um, CS needs to be a cross-functional, multidisciplinary mindset and culture and movement, right? Of how do we deliver value to the customer? Um, always based yeah. on 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 the front lines of the customer, which is the customer success team, right? And and I wonder if there's a way. I don't know. I wonder if there's a way to protect the function, but also grow it as a movement as well. And in that, invite these other disciplines. My background is in product management, like product, like marketing, mm -hmm. like sales. Maybe you do that through customer success excellence, right? Maybe that's maybe that's a, a large signaling factor into the winner of your awards, mm -hmm. what other groups have said. I don't know. But that's kind of my belief after speaking to other leaders. So I vehemently agree with you, if I may. And, and let me let me dive a little deeper, because when I say I don't like the term movement, I think we just kind of throw it around like we're part of this kind of like force of change. It, it just I think it, it almost devalues the work that's being done. Right. Product led growth comes to mind is like another thing that requires cross functional alignment to redesign an organization. And that's a business model change. Right. So so I, 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 movements, I wouldn't use to describe business model change because movement to me is fluffy. And we get in this world where, you know, yeah, this customer success movement, it's so exciting and it's, it's really, it's really great. But actually, you know, when you look at content out there for product led growth, data, bar graphs, pie charts, we're talking about business model transformation. And I agree with you. That's what customer success needs to become. And I think, you know, and maybe I'm taking our conversation in a completely different direction now, but um, I'm going to break the second rule of podcasting and just go right ahead, um, which is that I think we, in some ways, because customer success is both a team and a company-wide responsibility, we really find ourselves struggling to drive change and impact because we have to do our day job. And then when we have 10% of our extra time, we have to go out and influence other teams to make it more customer-centric. Product-led growth, I think, is again, is a good example. There's no product-led growth team. It is a business model change. And if there was a PLG team, they'd probably be in exactly the same situation where they're struggling to, to achieve their goals there, you know, NRR, that's a company-wide goal, yet see the CS leader is the one that's oftentimes has it targeted against them. So, so movement maybe is a voc has a, the wrong connotation from my point of view, but again, I speak almost Brit British English now, so let's just go with that uh, 
we're interpreting the word differently. But I completely agree this has to become a business model transformation more so than a fun community where we have interesting conversations about what we're not. Account Support, account management, and all those other yeah, things. Yeah, I, I like the way you frame that. Well, I like the way you frame it, Josh. So, so high Thank five, you. virtual Just high fives to us both. So what are you doing in the awards to help break down those walls? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we started small, uh, well, we started not massively, um, five awards, customer success leader of the year, CSM of the year, uh, uh, customer success rising star. So somebody who's been in the industry for less than two, two years or less. And then so those are the three awards for individuals. And then we also have two awards for innovation. One is the best use of technology in customer success. And the other is the most innovative customer success initiative. So really trying to kind of balance some team-wide, business-wide um, deliverables with some really standout individuals. Um, and, and we are dividing that regionally. So we had the EMEA Awards, the Americas Awards that I mentioned are coming, and we're also thinking about how we can accomplish something in Asia Pacific, but there's a lot of great innovation taking place uh, as well. In the application process, you know, 250 words or more per question, right? We're looking for real hard data about the situation um, when you joined in the situation today, both from a impact on customers perspective, but also colleagues and the company, and finally your impact on the customer success community. So those are a lot of the criteria and, and you know, it's not some, a lot of these awards devolve into either popularity contests or did you pay us, did you pay the shortlist fee, which I think is relatively antithetical to meritocratic awards. No fee so there's no fee to apply. There's no fee to, to, to um, be awarded. This is really about, a truly meritocratic. And for those who are wondering what the heck these people did, we are publishing an ebook after each award. So people can actually take things away and learn about what that next uh, generation of, of voices and thinkers has actually done so that we can all take something away for our business model transformation to, to go back to the previous. I love that. I love that. I love all of the, 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 the kind of usual suspects and faces on LinkedIn. They've all become very close friends of mine. They've all welcomed us myself and my company with open arms, but, yeah, same but at the same time, I really hope I don't see those faces in those awards, right? Let's, let's, well, let's get, yeah. Well, the good thing is a lot of those people are judges uh, for, for, so, so in some ways I'll speak only for myself, but I feel like I'm part of the problem, not the solution. So I think my, my penance is trying to at least create a, a, a program where we can replace ourselves, if you like. Um, because I think that's uh, super important, but a lot of them are donating their time to do exactly that, right? By reading every application, we had over 200 and I think over 300 nominations um, uh, in for the EMEA awards and, and they read every single one and uh, adjudicated based on a rubric. So I think we're trying to do our bit. Again, I won't speak for anybody but me, but that's at least yeah. my thing. Oh, that makes sense. I'm gonna drop this and then we can move on. What if you had an award for like the best friend of CS? So that the best, the, yeah, go on, that, keep, that, keep, that keep product going there. owner or that salesperson who did the best, who does the best handoffs and values the company, that CRO right. who, who honors, you know, the, the, the function of customer success, um, with the most appreciation and respect. Just a, just a thought there. I, I like that. No, I, I like it a lot. And, and, you know, I've really pushed, to be fair, I push back on a lot of suggestions because I'm stubborn and, and uh, egocentric, but I'm not going to do the same thing for, for this one because, you know, there's some vendors that, you know, want what, have a best technology category and all these other things. And again, this is not a pay to play. This is vendor agnostic. This is about people. This is about impact. But as we said, right, impact is not just CS impact, it's company wide. So, um, I will, you know what, if you'll have me, I'll break this news when we officially decide to bring it into the awards on this podcast. So that's a very weird and convoluted way of inviting myself back. So there you go. So you run the customer success excellence awards, and you also have an excellent day job as vice president of customer success at Cognite. You guys have grown to 700 people ish. Your uh, team is around 15 folks, which is wonderful. Tell us a little bit, you know, a lot of people listening may know Alex Farmer, may not know about Cognite. So let's actually give you an opportunity to share a little bit about what your company and, and then importantly, what your team is up to these days. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
So, so my background's in kind of the startup space, maybe mid-market enterprise CS. So uh, it's, it's mostly been kind of coming into places that don't really have a CS function and then building it out. Um, and that's, that's what Cognite is all about as well. I joined when we had two years ago, when we had 40 customers or so, we now have 85 or, and that's growing uh, maybe more than that uh, today. And we had a team, I inherited a team, I think of four CSMs who had newly been given the job title after doing project management for a lot of years. Um, so it was pretty much brand new. Um, Cognite, we are an industrial data ops company based in Oslo, Norway. Um, so I have the privilege of heading out to Norway pretty often, um, which is which is really, um, is absolutely a privilege, especially when, uh, if I may be so bold, your expenses are not uh, personal. Uh, it's a very expensive, but beautiful place. Um, and uh, actually Norway's first unicorn as well. So, so we kind of put Norway in the unicorn map about a year ago now, series A with Excel and series B with TCB. Um, industrial data ops is essentially solving not just, you know, the snowflakes uh, and, you know, data other data platforms of the world solve the IT software data issue, data in a bunch of different silos, right? And they do that well enough. At industrial data, the actual IoT status of individual pumps in an oil rig, a manufacturing plant, a power offshore wind turbine, uh, and then at historical IoT data as well, and you have a huge freezing data lake, as we like to say. Right? You can have a data lake, but it, you, never, you don't want to go swimming. You don't want to go for a dip. CDF, Cognite Data Fusion, is the product. It sits on top of you know, your Azure or your Google Cloud data warehouse, and it will contextualize your industrial data. So for our customers, essentially, we you know, make sense of all of the data that they have, both software and uh, uh, operations, OT data. Um, and that allows them to you know, reduce their environmental impact, increase their production, uh, predictive maintenance use cases, a lot of real value add to industry. So, so that's who we are. Um, but again, I joined two years ago and we started to build a team. Um, 85 customers, average contract value over a million dollars a year. So it's a very high, high touch model. And uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about, our team uh, launched a customer community when we had about 60 customers. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second, but at a high level, we've also, you know, rolled out customer health scoring, some of those basic things, and, and really focused a lot on customer journey as well. 700 employees and 85 customers. There's a lot of people doing a lot of stuff at Cognite and a lot of people wanting to engage with a customer, whether it's advanced data science use case deliveries, right? So professional services, uh, Cognite Data Fusion um, training and enablement, a lot of different teams doing a lot of different things. So one of the first things we did is really kind of focus in on how should the customer experience all of those teams? Not from not just from a people and process perspective, where we spend a lot of time, but also from a technology perspective, which is the reason why we built and launched that community with only, I think at the time, 60 customers. And I'm sure we'll get into that today. Yeah, there's a few things we can get into there. So we can talk about the touch points you have with the other disciplines on, on the, the last topic that we were chatting through. I think it's really interesting from a company that is so high touch with mm -hmm. only 85 customers, but large ticket high touch customers. We can talk about the overall customer journey. It sounds like you have a, a really well thought out plan playbook approach towards that. Uh, I'd love to learn about your tech stack. I'm sure others would as well. And then we can talk about community because I think that is really important. And you, you are seeing a trend in building communities to the end users as a means to delivering value to that community. Where do we start, Alex? Which one goes first? I might start in order, and if I remember the order, because I think some of them are quite simple and some of them also we're not doing very well, right? Um, you know, I think part of the challenge for us has been around collaboration between different teams. And it's not because we don't like each other and it's not because, you know, we're, we're kind of selfishly focused on our own goals. It's because there's so much happening all the time and, you know, it's not unique to Cognite. And, the phase that we find ourselves in, there's a lot of kind of going from, especially you know, from 40 to 85, really complex customers. When you think about it, there's different departments within one logo. So really we could think of ourselves as a much larger customer company anyway. A lot of different cooks in the kitchen, right? You have sales marketing, who's the sales team that sold the original deal, but they've only sold a proof of concept, right? So there's always a lot of POC motion there. And we then need to work together to convert that proof of concept to a long-term subscription so customers can build a bunch of different use cases on top of CDF. Um, so, so collaboration has been important. And I think where we invested the majority of our time was getting the collaboration between 
different departments within the post-sale organization working. So I lead the CSM team at Cognite. Uh, and again, 15 CSMs, 85 customers. I think our ratio is about four to one. Uh, somebody can check that math. That's not great math. Four and a half, five to one, but let's go with it. Um, and, and we originally had our challenge of seven people with sometimes the same job title doing stuff with a customer post-sale. And it was kind of this, you know, almost this like McKinsey model where you had a senior per senior, almost like partner person and a bunch of different people who were good at stuff, show up to the customer and say, yep, we got it. No problem. And, and that was a real challenge for us because customers didn't really know what to expect, who to go to for what the navigability. I think we thought it was customer centric to just kind of throw people at the customer and sit them in their office and just be there. But then A, COVID happened, so we had to change. And B, the navigability for the customer, of who the hell do I go to for what? Essentially setting their expectations up in the right way was seriously lacking. So, so we went through firstly, uh, the customer journey work that we did almost two years ago now was, okay, when does professional services get involved? When do they need to be involved in the pre-sales phase to make sure we're scoped because these highly comp complex scopes. Um, when does CS need to get introduced? Should we introduce them at the same time as professional services or do they, do they get their own moment, right? And, and when I joined, CS was not just doing CS, we were senior project people and pre-sales people, which in some ways meant less cooks in the kitchen, but in many ways meant way too many things to do reactively. And guess what? The proactivity is the last thing on our list, right? And that's a whole separate conversation. Um, so the customer journey work firstly was, hey, everybody in the post-sale organization, what do you do when? Who has the best template? So we're not building slides all the time from scratch. And how do I store that template in a place that allows us to control our messaging in a much smarter way, right? Seven really intelligent people that want to do something differently every time. That'd be fun for them, but it's not fun for the customer. And frankly, it's not fun for um, efficient disbursement of cash and resources by the business as well. Um, so that was kind of step one. And then from there, it was a lot easier to go out to other departments and say, don't engage with all of these post-sale teams. Here's how you're going to engage with our entire department and organization. Yeah, that's great. And so what did that mean to your tech stack? Yeah, I mean, it's always, especially like, it's such an interesting, I actually say this to new joiners at Cognite, who a lot of people are not from the software space, they're from industry. So ex-industrial consultants, right? Because there's a huge domain expertise need. And actually my team, one of the 15 had customer success management in their, on their CV before we hired them. Um, so, so actually there's a real domain expertise element, transferable skills that we're looking for. And that's, I've learned so much around kind of what good looks like from a Cognite CS perspective, just by interviewing. I think I have 117 pages of interview notes in a Google doc. I'm sure there's a better way, but that's my way. Um, but the reason I mention that is because in the new starter monthly orientation session, I always say to, cut to, to people, to new joiners, think of us not as a 700 employee company, think of us as an 85 customer company. Because if you're a 700 employee company in a standard SaaS environment, you expect, you know, you're, you're an enterprise, you're past the scale up phase. But if you're an 85 customer company, you're still experimenting with different use cases, playing around with some product market fit, um, and, and trying to kind of really kind of build the machinery that's going to get you to two, three, 400 customers, right? And the dissonance between those two things is always, I find quite uh, unique. And that translates itself to our technology as well. Cognite was a company when uh, we were doing this customer journey work that had 12, I actually have the slide that our community manager created, um, uh, to make the case for community. 12 different websites a customer could go to to do something related to our product, CDF. YouTube channel, uh, academy, site, support portal, knowledge base, GitHub, Stack Overflow, um, some others I can't remember, but believe me, uh, they existed. Uh, Google Drive shared with a customer, 12 different sites. So so we, we, we spent a lot of time, I actually have the picture of the whiteboard we, we drew uh, again, I'm sure there's a better way, but writing things on a whiteboard and taking a picture and emailing it to yourself. Never fails, never fails. <laughs> never failed me once. Uh, never fails, man. Yeah, I know there's companies trying to disrupt that, but uh, I'll be for my cold dead hands, as they say. Um, 
and 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 we went on this down this path of saying okay what's the right way to build one central place for customers to go for whatever content that they need we as a business is, is a function or as a business model transformation depending on what we're calling ourselves today uh spend a lot of time thinking about how customers adopt our product but i don't think we spend enough time thinking about how customers adopt all the material that is exists to support that adoption right training support guides knowledge base right our customers basically uh, what i was trying to say before is with 700 people and 85 customers we had a huge amount of content and a very low amount of adoption so what we did is we embarked on this journey to build a customer community it was not community as the primary goal but a community-led digital customer hub right so one place the customer goes to discover whatever is available to them and they can talk to other people. Well, actually, if, actually if they I want to like ask you a question well. on that, Alex. So and it, I find it sounds you know, almost a little antithetical because you're telling me that you guys are very high touch, right? I mean, um, clearly, based on the numbers that you've shared, yeah. I would think, maybe naively, that a community type play, community led play, would be for companies that can really only only have the resources to be lower touch. So how does how did what plays into that? Well, yeah, yeah. And that's conventional, that's conventional wisdom. And I think it's true, but what we've seen now, and what I think people are starting to realize is that customers don't always want to, you know, they want to do something at 10 PM when they can't talk to their high touch CSM, right? So what we were forced to do with digital only customer success, if we do it right, actually is more convenient than one-to-one -one CS anyway. And let, let, let's actually unpack that a little bit because it's a perfect example. If you're a CSM and you're doing one-to-one -one CS, what are you doing all day? Right. Maybe you're looking at customer health data, trying to figure out which customer is having a problem with this new feature. Maybe you're rolling out some playbook to drive adoption of a new module, or maybe you're spending four hours on a QBR deck. Right. But all of those things output some artifact. It might be a playbook. I'm going to email the customer. I'm going to do the QBR and then send them the PDF attachment with some bullet point notes. Right. They're never going to look at that email again. They're never gonna look and open that attachment again. So even though a person is doing this, there's, there's two elements here. One, how can the customer access in a simple way the stuff that has been done on their behalf in a one-to-one, -one, you know, the one-to-one -one stuff, EBR decks and customer success plans. And then also how can the CSM not create stuff from scratch, but pull, you know, send a link to the adoption handbook that is sat in the community digital hub area to the customer, because guess what? CSM doesn't have to create it from scratch. Customer has a link they can always go back to. And while they're there, they might find other content. They might find a, a use case example from another customer that they didn't even know Cognite Data Fusion could help them accomplish, which leads to what we call community qualified leads and drives upsell, right? So, so essentially the goal was very simple parallel. Marketing's job, let me not speak for all of marketeers in the world, but uh, let, me, let me roughly summarize. We create content and awareness, but the call to action is to come back to our website and do a demo or give us your information. As soon as you become a customer, what is your marketing call to action, right? Market, you know, there's no, what, where do I call you back to, to experience my company digitally, right? And without one central place, it's a mishmash of websites, phone calls, Slack messages. So the customer experience is kind of dying in what I, I like to call the org chart tech stack. The support team has their support portal, so they make it, the support portal makes the support team's job easier and gives a little self-service to the customer. The training team has their training system, right? So I access the training team's content on the training site, right? CS has maybe some, some port onboarding team has their Gantt chart publicly available to the customer. But those are all tools for internal departments, not a company-wide, if we go all the way back to our previous conversation, company-wide digital stack that the customer goes to, to find everything that they need. And that's what we set out to do because our customers expect high touch customers, high expectations, high depth of relationship, you know, kind of the platinum tier of engagement. And that platinum tier needs to extend not just from the one-to-one -one conversations they're having, but the removal of friction for them to do anything digitally with our business. And that's why we, we really embarked on this community strategy, not to be a 13th system alongside the other 12, but to be the one place they can go to log a support ticket, right? And again, we just embed our support tool, our training tool directly in community 
So the customer just has one place to go and then can do whatever else they need to do. And then for me, the, the, the next frontier is that we really start treating uh, community as the post-sale website. And, and, and go with me for a second, right? I write it, you know, very simply, we write case studies on our web with our customer advocates, right? To get new customers and marketing puts it on the website. Our existing customers don't go to our website to engage with content. I guarantee you 90% of the time, they're just looking for the damn login button to the product they purchased, right? So there's no time to capture their attention and awareness to drive upsell, right? Again, if we accept 70% of revenue comes from the next sale, not the first sale, where is the equivalent website to market to them? And that to me, if we, if we build something that is useful and remove friction, a community, then we can start using it as a website where the call to action is, uh, here's an example of another customer hero and how they achieve these incredible business outcomes with our product, right? Oh, and by the way, it requires you buy this additional module. Let's have a conversation, right? So really trying to think of kind of community almost as the new post-sale marketing is, is where this could go, I think. And it's been really exciting to invest uh, in, in pushing that forward with uh, our community manager and, and community led growth as the post sale marketing. I like it. It's got a nice ring to it. Alex, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to meeting you, I hope, in San Francisco in a couple of weeks. And hey, hey I won't, I'll, I'll run to you and not away from you. It's been a pleasurable in experience. Nashville, Miami, or Austin. Good. I'll, uh, you'll have to separately tell me which one you prefer because we'd love to have you there. But uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. And again, I, I, it sounds like you're bought into this idea where we're going to see some of those new voices here on the podcast, for example, uh, as well. So that. I'll have to send you our show. I'd love that. And Thanks a lot. Make sure we have, make that happen. Awesome.